Did you know that two out of every three guys are going to experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? I certainly did, and for me, I cracked that a good decade early. I was losing my hair by the time I was 25. Look, I wish Keeps had been around since when I was younger because advancements in science meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair that you have. And you can get an expert treatment plan without ever having to visit a doctor's office or pharmacy, and it's delivered directly to your front door, all at about half the cost of a traditional pharmacy. Yeah. Keeps offers clinically proven research-backed treatments to stop hair loss and improve your hair growth. And because it's a simple subscription model, their regular refill reminders and fast shipping will keep you stocked up on all the products you need to take care of your hair. So how does it work? Well, for one thing, there's no need to visit a doctor's office. Just schedule a quick online consult, and a little bit later, a discreet package will arrive at your door, and you can use it in the privacy of your own home. Each treatment plan comes with a year of free messaging, so you can connect with your medical provider at any time. So hair loss stops with keeps you guys can get a 50 percent discount off your order by going to keeps.com slash megaprojects that's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash megaprojects or just click the link in the description below and you'll get 50 percent off your order and now today's video It'll be one of the most single complex missions in NASA history. A piece of science so complicated it will make even the James Webb Telescope look straightforward. Toward the end of this decade, the agency will partner with the ESA to launch two new craft toward Mars. But rather than merely carrying another orbiter or a shiny new probe, they'll instead be part of an ambitious mission that's been underway since 2021, when the Perseverance rover touched down on the Red Planet to safely bring back rock samples from another planet to Earth for the first time in human history. Samples that may contain the clearest evidence yet that ancient life once thrived on Mars. For NASA, this will mean pulling off engineering feats at the limits of possibility. Feats like deploying autonomous helicopters on the Martian surface. Feats like launching a sample-carrying robot from the surface of another world. Feats that are going to be at the heart of today's video. For nearly two years now, the NASA rover Perseverance has been exploring the edges of Yezero Crater, a vast depression on the Martian surface 45 kilometers across. Created nearly 4 billion years ago by a colossal asteroid impact, Yezero Crater is one of Mars's most distinctive features, up there with the great dead volcano known as Olympus Mons. But while it might be impressively sized, it's not the crater's girth that gets NASA scientists all hot and bothered under the collar. Rather, it's the history. 3.7 billion years ago, Yezero Crater wasn't the empty dust bowl that it seems to be today. Instead, it was a lake, a giant lake filled with liquid water shimmering under the Martian sky. And the goal of Perseverance, the goal of the entire Mars sample return mission, is to figure out whether that lake once played host to alien life. Exactly how NASA plans to answer this will form the main part of today's episode. The part with all the engineering and the mad science that that I know you'll love. But before we get there, we need to first quickly establish why this place is so important. Why Yezero Crater is such a good target that NASA is willing to spend $7 billion in taxpayers' money investigating it. The answer lies in the exact kind of lake that it used to be. Far back in the distant past, Yezero Lake, and fun linguistic fact, Yezero means lake in many Slavic languages, was connected to a pair of muddy, silty deltas, one feeding in and the other allowing excess water to run out. This means the lake's contents were constantly getting refreshed, or which suggests that salt levels would have never risen high enough to make water inimical to life. That's important, because the big gamble at the heart of these Mars missions is that life once evolved on the Red Planet, that the thick atmosphere and the the presence of liquid surface water created conditions ideal for microbes to arise. If it did, then Yezero was probably the perfect breeding ground. It's also probably the perfect environment for finding fossilized traces. Deep below the water, the lake bed would have been a mess of mud, sand, and silt, with fresh deposits adding layer after layer as the centuries wore on. Any microorganisms that lived and died in these ancient waters would have sunk to the bottom and been buried, preserving traces of their existence. Traces that could still remain even now, over 3.5 billion years after Yezero Lake dried out. 
Before Perseverance even arrived, NASA had already identified promising rock types that correspond to what we see on Earth. Rocks like laminations, which are created from mud deposits in deltas, or ancient clay, which we know is spectacularly good at holding traces of organic material. But perhaps the most promising of all are carbonate minerals. On Earth, the earliest known signs of life are stromalotites, weird, lumpy rocks made of carbonate materials that seem to stick up from the ground like deformed mushrooms. But rather than being caused by drunken moles or possibly morlocks, stromatolites are effectively reefs made by microbes, formations that couldn't exist without life being present. Find something similar in Yezero Crater, and we'd have proof that the red planet was once teeming with tiny creatures. And if we could prove that Mars was once alive, well, that would have all sorts of staggering implications for where else we might find life in the universe. This is the mission that Perseverance is on, to collect samples from all of these different rock formations so we can learn the truth about Mars's history. To this end, the rover is carrying 43 sterilized titanium tubes, each capable of holding a finger-sized piece of Martian rock, rock that the rover has drilled out and sealed away for later study. As of fall 2022, 14 of those tubes have been filled with samples from seven different rocks. An additional one contains a sample of Mars's atmosphere, the result of one rock disintegrating under the pressure of the rover's drill. By 2030, 38 of those tubes should have been used, with an additional five left empty as a control group so we can see what contamination, if any, Perseverance carried from Earth. But here's the crazy part. Perseverance isn't capable of analyzing any of these samples itself. No, if we want to unlock Mars's secrets, we need to get them back to Earth. And exactly how NASA plans to do that is what makes this mission a true mega project. So, you might be assuming at this stage that getting samples back from Mars should be pretty easy. Just wait till Elon Musk finally lands his long promised mission there, have an astronaut leap out and grab them. It couldn't be easier. Right? Well, no, that's totally wrong and fanciful. Although doing things this way around would be pretty straightforward, it also relies on some pretty big assumptions about humanity managing a crewed flight to Mars in the near future. And NASA doesn't tend to launch billion dollar missions on the basis of step one, collect samples, step two, who knows in step three profit that means the agency has to proceed on the basis that we can't just ask mac damon to pop out from his mars base and do the hard work for us so how do you collect rock samples on a distant planet when you can't use humans and the answer is with unbelievable difficulty. Work on Mars sample return concepts have been underway for over 30 years. In all that time, multiple ideas have been discarded, the latest as recently as fall 2022. That means that everything we're about to tell you is only the most up-to-date version of the plan. At the time of recording, it has yet to be officially signed off, although it seems unlikely the mission architecture will change drastically again. What is certain, though, is the first stage. At some point in the very near future, Perseverance will begin depositing a cache of its rock samples. Remember how we said the rover has taken two samples of every rock so far drilled? That's so one of each kind can be placed at a flat target site known as Three Forks. That way, if the rover is somehow compromised or fails, there will be a backup set of samples all laid out and ready to be retrieved. It'll do this across its lifespan, periodically dropping half of its samples off at predetermined points. This means they'll be nice and ready for when the sample retriever lander finally arrives. With the planned launch in 2028, the SRL is the next major component of the mission, a probe that will blast off from Earth, cross the Gulf of Space, and finally touch down in Yezero Crater in 2031. Now, the original plan was that another probe would land alongside it, one containing a new rover designed by the European Space Agency that would zoom out at high speed to collect the cached samples. But a recent NASA review decided that adding another rover would just make things way too expensive and way too complicated, especially since Perseverance is still functioning just fine. So the ESA rover was scrapped this year, and now the plan is that Perseverance herself will drive the samples over to the sample retrieval lander, where a robotic arm will take the tubes and stow them inside an onboard rocket. Of course, though, we all know what happens to the best laid bands of mice, men, and warmongering dictators, they often go horribly wrong. Which is why the SRL will come with a backup retrieval system, just in case Perseverance is somehow disabled. A system that will take the form of two 
autonomous helicopters. Known officially as the sample recovery helicopters, these two extra passengers will look a whole lot like Ingenuity, the adorable little box that went to the Red Planet with Perseverance and became the first object to fly on another world. Unlike Ingenuity, though, each will be fitted with a tiny robot arm, an arm perfectly sized to pick up sealed tubes from a cache. If Perseverance is out of commission, these are the guys who will be getting the samples back. They'll fly over to the caches, pick up one tube at a time, and return them to SRL. From there, the plan will be the same as before. The ESA's robotic arm will grab the tubes and take them on board the sample retrieval lander to stow inside the hidden rocket. And yes, you heard that right, a rocket. Because it's not just enough for NASA to get the rocks back to SRL. Oh no, they also need to get them back home. And doing that will require achieving yet another first. The first ever rocket launched on another planet. Very occasionally when doing these videos, we find ourselves wondering if we made the right career choice. If we shouldn't have, you know, turned our backs on making YouTube videos and instead become engineers. That's because the sort of stuff people get up to when planning these missions sounds honestly less like a job and more like a daily attempt to do the unimaginably awesome. Case in point right here, the recent tests for throwing a goddamn rocket ship into the sky. Although the Mars Ascent Vehicle, the technical name for what we're calling the goddamn rocket ship, is going to be a mere 3 meters or 10 feet tall, using a chemical reaction to even get that airborne would probably destroy the sample retrieval lander. So, rather than launch it from the ground, the team decided the sensible thing to do would be to fire the engines when it was already in the air. That meant designing Vector, the short-form name of the Vertically Ejected Controlled Tip-Off Release, but perhaps better explained as the mechanism for throwing the goddamn rocket into the sky. Based on a piston system, Vector will wait until the Mars Ascent vehicle is filled with 30 sample tubes, then when the time is right, it will release, hurling the MAV 5.5 meters off the ground. At that point, the first stage motor will come to life and the journey to the heavens will begin. And what a journey it is going to be. The rocket needs to reach speeds of 4,000 meters a second to escape Mars's gravity and get into space. For those of you who feel their eyes glaze over at metric units, that's 8,950 miles per hour, far faster than even a bullet or a retreating Russian soldier. As the rocket's senior program manager told Space.com with remarkable understatements, quote, we've never launched a rocket from Mars, so there's a lot of technology involved here. However, don't go thinking a successful rocket launch will mark the end of the mission. In fact, NASA's job will only be just beginning. If all goes well, it will be 2031 when the MAV finally blasts off from Mars and gets into orbit. At which point, it'll need to rendezvous with a probe that will have been waiting for five long years. Known as Earth Return Orbiter, that probe is currently slated to be built by the ESA with the target of launching from Earth in 2027. It'll then journey to Mars and settle into orbit above the Red Planet, ready and waiting for the Martian rocket ship to bring the samples from the surface. Once the MAV finally enters Mars orbit, it will activate a beacon, a beacon that will allow the Earth return orbiter to lock onto it and fly over for collection. At which point, the fun really begins. By now, all that's left of the Mars rocket should be the orbiting sample container, basically the rocket nose containing all the bits of rock that Perseverance drilled out. From what we could tell watching NASA's explainer videos, the container will then have to fly perfectly into a catchment tube on the Earth return orbiter, which will quickly transfer it into a special protective place for the long journey home. Two years later, in 2033, that probe will finally appear in our night sky. A high-tech bottle swept across a jet black ocean containing a message from another world. Only it's not as simple as everyone now cheering and breaking out the champagne, because this utterly insane mission still won't be over. Those samples will have to survive being deliberately crashed into the Earth. We get it. We've spent this video bombarding you with names of pieces of kit. It's a lot to keep up with and we're still not done. Once the Earth return orbiter finally does what its name promises and returns to Earth, it'll be time for the final piece of hardware to do its job, the Earth entry system. The part of the probe the samples will be placed in, the EES, in many ways, has the least complicated job of all. Once the probe reaches Earth, it'll get fired out at high speed and then go crashing into the Utah desert. But as you probably guessed, 
Not as easy as it sounds. With no parachute, the EES is expected to impact the ground at colossal speeds. Speeds that would turn even Sonic the Hedgehog into pulp, splattering him across the beehive state in just a blue, gooey mess. Therefore, the EES has to be built in such a way that it will survive the impact. Designed by Lockheed Martin, the last stage of this mission will be made of a special lightweight composite structure wrapped in high-grade thermal protective material. And returning to our theme of engineers getting to do awesome stuff at work, they're actually testing it out right now. The Utah Test and Training Range has recently seen multiple dummy versions of the EES taken up to almost the height of the Empire State Building and then hurled spectacularly into the ground to check for damage. All of them so far have survived. Assuming the real EES does so, then the moment it strikes the desert will mark the final end of the journey that began back in 2021 when Perseverance touched down on the edge of Yezero Crater. Just think about that for a second. All those individual steps that will have been taken to get these 30 rock samples to Earth. All those probes and orbiters and landers, each worth millions of dollars, culminating in this one moment. Of course, the rewards we could get out of it are incalculable. Solid evidence at long last that life once thrived on our sister planet, a signal that it could therefore have evolved elsewhere too. An implication that, out there in the vastness of our galaxy, there might therefore be other intelligent life forms that we might not be alone. Not that anyone is really expected to open these samples and immediately discover a fossilized space fish or anything like that. More likely, it will take years upon years of analysis in a series of specially built labs designed to contain biohazards, years of analysis that will eventually, hopefully, uncover some marker of microbial life that could only have come from the waters of Yezero Lake nearly four billion years ago. Nonetheless, NASA is being forced to proceed on the basis that there might be something living in those samples even now. The idea of contamination is a huge one in the search for extraterrestrial life. If you watched our Icy Probes video, you'll know that there are plenty of scientists who lie awake at night worrying about importing Earth bacteria to a pristine environment like Europa. Well, the reverse is also true. There's a tiny, tiny chance, a mere fraction of 1% that the samples Perseverance digs up could contain living microbes unlike anything found on Earth. If those microbes got released into our environment, they might cause havoc. Ecosystems could collapse. A superpathogen might do to the entire human race what smallpox did to the first Native Americans who encountered Europeans. That's a theory, at least. Although, given that Mars rocks fall to Earth as meteorites all the time, the chances of it actually happening are just vanishingly remote. Still, it does mean that the 30 samples won't end their journey being distributed to scientists all around the globe, but instead inside a special facility designed to mimic a level 4 biolab. You know, the sort of biolab where stuff like anthrax and Ebola and other delightful things are kept. But while it's good to be careful, the honest truth is that we shouldn't expect microbes in those sample flasks. Shouldn't even expect clear evidence of ancient bygone life. What we should expect are 30 rock samples that will mark the start of a journey. One that will be methodically undertaken in research papers and obscure journals that most of us have never heard of. The journey that goes as science always does, slowly, unspectacularly, but also one that may eventually end with perhaps the greatest discovery in human history. It's fashionable in some quarters today for people to complain about NASA spending, to look at a mission like this with an estimated $7 billion price tag, and declare oh, we should give that money to starving people instead, as if science and charity represent just a binary choice. The kind of matter and antimatter that can't exist at the same time without annihilating one another. Yet to take this view, is to be woefully short-sighted. The money NASA spends annually is barely half a percentage point of the US government's overall expenditure, significantly less than is spent on federal anti-hunger program SNAP. And what we get in return as a species is utterly invaluable. With missions like this, or the Europa Clipper, or the James Webb Space Telescope, scientists are trying to answer the most fundamental questions a human being can ask. Where do we come from? Are we alone in the universe? Is our existence a miracle, a freak accident, or just one more spark of life in a galaxy teeming with civilizations? In barely a decade, Mars Sample Return will take one of the first tentative steps in answering these questions, in solving one of the greatest mysteries of our time. In doing so, it will be providing unimaginable benefits to all mankind.